Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining. We are super excited to have this uh, unique experience uh, talking at the DEF CONF. Uh, so my name is Sean Paz. I'm a solution architect at uh, Red Hat IGC. And with me is Or Friedman. I'll let him introduce himself, Or. Hi, I am Or. I'm part of the RGW team. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so we are here to discuss with you uh, about how you could uh, leverage NGINX in order to use it as a CDN layer for uh, Cypherdos Gateway. Uh, so moving through the agenda for the next 25 minutes, uh, we'll start off by uh, talking a little bit about Ceph and uh, what is Ceph in general, and we'll dive deeper into Ceph's uh, architecture uh, in order to understand how we can use uh, the CDN cache layer in order to uh, uh, gain more performance in our cluster. Uh, we'll talk about what are the reasons that we need to use uh, CDN in the first place, and we'll also show you uh, how we have integrated those uh, two components uh, in order to get uh, much more uh, much more performance from our SF cluster. Uh, we'll show you some uh, performance statistics uh, so you could see the, the, the difference between using uh, this feature and uh, uh, without using it. And we'll uh, also have a demo that you can visualize it in your own eyes and uh, you can see the, how per the performance differentiate. Uh, we'll end up having a, a short Q&A uh, session. So it's important for me to say uh, there are no stupid questions. Uh, feel free to ask any question that you have. Uh, and we'll uh, be happy to uh, to answer it at the end of this uh, session. So uh, we'll start off by uh, talking about Ceph. So what is Ceph? Ceph is basically a, a distributed uh, software-defined uh, storage solution, uh, which is uh, unified. And by unified, I mean that uh, Ceph supports all the relevant uh, storage protocols that are in the market at the moment. Uh, so by using Ceph, you could have uh, block, file, and object storage all located in the same uh, cluster. And we see Ceph uh, being used in various uh, various use cases, uh, mainly in modern workloads such as uh, cloud infrastructure, data analytics, major repositories, backup and restore, uh, et cetera. So uh, diving a little deeper into Ceph's architecture, uh, we see that Ceph is basically a software-defined storage solution, which means that each component in Ceph uh, is actually a piece of software. Uh, all the software pieces are eventually talking and interacting with each other in the cluster. Uh, and this is what gives us um, the, the main cluster, clusterized experience uh, when managing the Ceph cluster. Uh, looking at the components, we see that we have uh, two uh, major components, which are, uh, first of all, uh, the MONs, uh, which are responsible for the authentication and the cluster management and the OSDs that are responsible for storing the actual data that is being saved uh, to the cluster. Uh, there are some additional components, but they are less relevant for uh, this uh, specific presentation. And it's important to say uh, that the fact is that uh, Ceph is an SDS solution. So um, basically, each one of those components uh, is represented uh, mostly as systemd services or uh, in the latest versions of Ceph uh, containers as well. Uh, looking at the data flow, we see that we have uh, three different uh, storage protocols, uh, which are uh, Redos Gateway for the S3 service, RBD for the block storage, and uh, CephFS for the file storage. So each one of the objects uh, that is being written to each one of those storage protocols is being divided into uh, a different set of pools. So for example, if I'm a user and I'm trying to interact with uh, the Redos Gateway S3 service, uh, I will end up with using uh, a certain uh, a set of pools. And uh, each object that is reading to uh, a pool is actually uh, getting its location calculated. So the calculation is being made at the client level. So objects uh, are written to, uh, to the cluster, for example, to a specific pool, and uh, they get a unique hash uh, that will eventually uh, define their location in the cluster. Uh, the result of this calculation is actually uh, the PG, which is the placement group. Uh, that the PG helps us distribute the, the objects in the cluster. Uh, so 
each object is being uh, divided into a different PG, or we have a, a group of objects that are relevant to a specific uh, PG ID. And this is how uh, we distribute the objects uh, between the OSDs. And uh, with the PGs, we also control the, the data protection strategies uh, that are now uh, divides into two uh, protection strategies. Uh, one is replica, where we save the object uh, multiple times in the cluster. And the second one is erasure coding, when we chunk the object and we distribute it uh, among OSDs in the cluster. One thing that is important to mention, though, it's uh, the crush map. Uh, the crush map actually holds the cluster state and the topology. So uh, basically, when one of the one of Ceph's components fails, whether it's a disk, uh, a server, a rack, or even a data center, uh, the crush map is getting uh, automatically notified. So this is how Ceph knows how to replicate uh, the data into another location in order to maintain uh, our uh, wanted recovery. Uh, so why do we uh, need CDN anyway? Uh, so CDN, just for record, is uh, is our way to cache objects uh, and fetch them into an external component, which is not relying on the Ceph cluster. And the main reason why we should use CDN is, uh, first of all, because it offloads the intense workloads from the cluster. Uh, so basically, we saw in the previous slide uh, that uh, two users, for example, that are trying to reach the same object from the same uh, bucket are eventually uh, ending up using the same set of disks because this object has its own location. Uh, so as the, the number of user grow, uh, we will end up uh, saturating the disks. So uh, having the CDN can help with that. Uh, another reason is because it decreases the latency dramatically. Uh, think of it when we take a look at our cluster performance, eventually uh, it's being uh, directly affected um, by the weakest part in the chain. So the weakest part at the moment is the disk layer. Uh, so right now, when we take the objects and we fetch them into an external component, we actually uh, are allowed to retrieve them from RAM, which decreases the latency dramatically. Uh, when decreasing the latency, I mean, we all know that as the latency uh, decreases, the number of operations that we could, uh, uh, let's say, interact with the cluster uh, is a lot higher. So we could gain more performance uh, when getting uh, the CDN deployed uh, in front of the Redis gateway. We see a lot of use cases uh, where uh, customers are uh, deploying their, uh, their applications to the edge or the far edge, and uh, eventually uh, their storage systems are being located in the central cloud. So there is no logic in uh, having your application uh, closer to the end customer, and eventually the storage is uh, is located in the in the central cloud. So uh, in this way, you could take the CDN and deploy it uh, closer to your uh, application so the, the end customer experience will be better and the response time will be lower. Uh, last but not least, you could also have, uh, you could also use a read ahead mechanism uh, where, for example, a generic use case, you need to uh, stream a video uh, one gigabyte size. So you will end up with uh, fetching and uh, reading a different set of bytes each time. Uh, when streaming the, the video. So this is how the cache uh, layer could help you uh, with uh, the read ahead, read ahead mechanism. So it will prefetch all the, the, the certain sets of bytes that you need uh, to read in the future. So you will eventually end up with having more sustainable and persistent uh, latency and response time. Uh, so in this point, I'll be moving the control to Or. Or, the stage is yours, buddy. Thank you. So um, we chose Nginx as a CDN in front of uh, the RGW, the uh, S3 gateway. Um, we chose it because of Nginx uh, as a couple of uh, advantage, advantages uh, uh, on other uh, solutions like uh, Varnish, for example. Uh, Nginx is really easy to uh, change uh, uh, Nginx and using and customize it and using, uh, for example, Lua to change things. And uh, it's quite common uh, across uh, CDN uh, providers like uh, Cloudflare, if I if I remember right. And 
So we chose the Nginx, so how it works, um, the solution. So one client is sending a GET request to the Nginx, the Nginx uh, will send the request with uh, another header and will author and will let the RGW to authorize the um, the request. The, the main issue with with CDN is that when you are caching the object, you will get eventually a public access object, and you don't always want to uh, um, to create the the object without the uh, ACLs. Uh, sometimes you, you want to. Uh, just uh, uh, you cache it and not letting and and not letting uh, anyone to access it after it. So uh, the Nginx after uh, it will get the uh, 200 or 404 from the RGW of 403. It it will uh, then uh, send the request without uh, authentication and will. And store the the object the the body uh, on a configured uh, directory. So after it, if uh, another client will send a request, the, the Nginx will send just the authentication API request and will just uh, send from the uh, from the local directory the the body. So. We are getting authenticated uh, CDN for S3. This is uh, something special there because we don't have this uh, solution uh, um, somewhere else. I mean, um, I think it's quite easy to just uh, uh, cache uh, HTTP requests, but here we, we are providing uh, uh, authentication mechanism that, and we are not uh, delegating uh, permissions to the Nginx. Nginx is just man in the middle, and uh, it almost can't uh, uh, change the request or not um, uh, handling the authentication itself. So uh, this is the advantage here. And the second thing that uh, Sean uh, talked about is that uh, there is a redirect mechanism. It's something that there, I, I don't think there is a, a redirect mechanism in other uh, CDNs. Uh, Nginx uh, has a nice feature called uh, uh, smart cache, uh, which means that if someone is, is wants only, uh, I don't know, a zero byte to one byte, uh, so the uh, typically the CDN will uh, cache only uh, the first byte and that's uh, two bytes, sorry. And that's it. And for uh, Nginx, there is a mechanism to uh, override the range uh, header and request uh, all uh, object without uh, partial content. And and after it, if someone will send, uh, I don't know, a byte uh, two to three, it will get uh, um, it from a local cache. And Nginx will not need to uh, uh, send the request again to to RGW and to request the the uh, body again. So it will only send the authentication uh, request. Um, next slide, please. Sure, next. Oh, thanks. Um, so, uh, as we talked about, there there are two uh, new APIs uh, for this feature that we have added to RGW, uh, the authentication API and the cache API. Um, the authentication API is for the authentication, obviously, um, if I mean both APIs, we don't really need them, 
we use them only when we want to. I mean, if we want to cache uh, we, and to create uh, public access objects eventually on the Nginx, we can uh, just change a little bit the Nginx configuration and we will get, uh, without the authentication API, we will get much faster uh, response time because we, we will just uh, uh, send the, the body from the Nginx without asking uh, the RGW about the permissions. Uh, the second thing is the cache API. So the cache API is a little bit uh, complicated. Um, it the, the thing is that most of the applications are signing the range header as, uh, uh, as part of the AWS v4. Uh, signature. So um, the thing with the cache API is that we are wrapping um, the headers requests before uh, sending it to the RGW. We are using a spatial uh, a user with spatial cap capabilities. We are giving the Nginx the ability to, uh, to wrap uh, the whole request that the user have uh, sent um, to uh, the RGW. And um, this way we can uh, uh, change the range header. So even if, because a uh, Nginx needs to, to change the range header to get the whole object, if you want to use read -head. Um, it needs it, it needs to to just send the the request without um, um, without the range header. So it's a problematic thing because the the RGW uh, uh, wants to get the range header too, and it won't. So it will uh, return a, a signature does not match. So this way, uh, the spatial user is wrapping the all request, and the spatial user itself can uh, override uh, eventually the range header. So, if the the range header is signed with uh, zero to two, and the Nginx will send uh, without range header or with the range header with different uh, um, range will allow, the RGW will allow the request uh, this way. And so this is the, the second thing we, we've we added uh, with this uh, feature. Uh, because we saw, for example, uh, video streamings and uh, and so on that uh, they're using uh, range requests and we want the the Nginx will send only uh, one request and then just uh, bring it uh, to the client from page cache or from disk. Um, and this is the thing and we can also uh, not using the cache API and just uh, uh, using the cache on top of uh, range headers. So if the user will request uh, uh, zero to one, and then uh, one to two. It will need to the Nginx will uh, catch those requests separately. And uh, next slide, please, Sean. Thank you. Um, so in this slide, we can see that um, we are getting almost uh, twice the performance. And then uh, RGW alone without uh, the um, Nginx uh, CDN. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, we will get more if the client is remotely and the CDN is remotely. If we have any uh, bandwidth limit uh, between the uh, client and the RGW. And so we, we are seeing something uh, else that uh, on uh, 16K, we will get uh, 
better performance on the RGW um, than the Nginx. The thing is here is that the Nginx is sending uh, two requests, right? Uh, uh, or even uh, one request, but is still uh, in the middle. So uh, on the yellow line, uh, is still the Nginx still sending the authentication API, the authentication call. So it will limit uh, eventually the, the number of requests uh, for uh, small objects. I mean, the, the overhead of, uh, of uh, requesting the authentication is quite the same. But for uh, larger objects, um, um, we, we don't see uh, uh, that it will uh, impact. I mean, it will impact to use uh, the Nginx for uh, bigger uh, sizes and for uh, 10 megabyte object size. Uh, the limit uh, was probably because of um, bandwidth limit in the lab. And, and as we we, uh, we thought, we, we got um, a little bit slower uh, request when the object is not cached. Because we we are sending in the in the first uh, request we are sending uh, two uh, requests, and then we are sending just the authentication request. And then Genix is probably much faster because it doesn't have all the layers; it's just uh, storing a single file or not single files, just files on the local directory. And we could use uh, NVMe for for caching the, the cached objects. Um, so I want to talk a, lot, a little bit about the demo we are going to present. Um, the demo is, uh, is using OpenResty, which is a kind of Nginx uh, wrapped with uh, Lua scripting for the cache uh, API, we're using Lua, script, uh, Lua scripting to uh, wrap the, uh, the user headers. And uh, we are using, uh, uh, for the cache API too, um, uh, Nginx uh, authentication. And, uh, and 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 AWS uh, uh, signer uh, module, and we will see in the demo that the performance uh, are much uh, when we are dealing with the edge location, the CDN uh, has a, a lot of uh, impact on the requests. We will see that the, it's quite the same RGW and Nginx without cache, and then you will see that. Uh, with cache, it will get much faster uh, response time. So uh, we can go to the demo. Just let me know that you see the screen, right? Yes, Sean. The screen is visible. So we are compiling um, the open resty. Then as you can see, we are using AWS hot module and hot request and HTTP slice. Uh, um, it's another feature of the Nginx and the cache API that the Nginx can not just uh, uh, read the whole body, Nginx can uh, read the uh, slices that we declared. For example, uh, give me a half megabyte each uh, range. So it will just send uh, uh, in parallel a uh, half megabyte requests to the backend, to the RGW. I think it's important to mention that uh, here we have two uh, splitted screens. 
So the, the right screen is uh, the Redis gateway itself. And uh, in the left screen, we are actually uh, deploying the, the Nginx cache layer. A guide how to uh, deploy the uh, Nginx with the RGW and so on is uh, in uh, the documentation. Uh, we'll share it with the slides. We, we, we replace the Nginx with the OpenRST. We create a deer for uh, uh, Nginx to uh, save the cached objects. Basically, this is configurable as uh, in the Nginx kernel, if we could uh, decide which directory will be used for the cache, uh, for caching the objects. And uh, eventually we rely on the VFS cache in the uh, Nginx server itself to retrieve the objects from RAM. We could also uh, store those uh, objects and cache them in, uh, in RAM itself. So here we are changing the uh, cache user. We are using uh, the access key and secret key we are going to create on the RGW for the cache user. And we change the list of RGWs to only one RGW, but we can use as much as we can, as much as we want, sorry. And for, for, uh, the, for the Nginx uh, configuration. So now we create it with AMZ cache, which means that we can wrap the request. Um, currently is the request to the RGW. Uh, five megabyte file. And sorry, 50 megabyte file. Uh, it's important to mention, I think, that uh, in the first test, uh, where we are reaching to the Redis gateway itself remotely, uh, the 50 megabytes file is being retrieved in 29 seconds. And as you see, as we go on, um, the object is being retrieved from cache. So there is a lot of difference between the first test and the second test, and even uh, all the tests uh, that uh, are following. So I think it's time for Q and A. Uh, feel free to ask any question that you have. Sean, we have three questions here uh, from the yeah. Q and A panel. So the first one is, Nginx is kind of load balancer. Uh, is it helps? It does it help the performance by load balance caching? Um, it could help, but the the limit there is, I think, the the capacity of the uh, single Nginx. Nginx has some uh, um, load balancing by uh, sharding the URI, so you can uh, eventually uh, uh, shard the caching across Nginx servers. So you will get, if you have, for example, a free Nginx, uh, every server with one terabyte NVMe, you will eventually get three terabyte of uh, cache of different uh, objects. And uh, another thing I want to uh, say about it is that uh, this cache is, of course, uh, eventually consistent. It means that, uh, uh, you will get uh, all the object uh, than what you have. I mean, if you are updating uh, frequently the, the underlying layer and not just uh, 
writing and reading uh, you you will have to or just uh, decreasing the in the nginx configuration the time for caching i mean oh and the nginx will send a request just to check the e tag of the object uh, or um, you will not be able to use it if you want to get the latest object or if you don't want to use a smaller uh, uh, update in the nginx so uh, alex is it okay for you is the answer is um, is okay Alex, feel free to let us know in the chat here regarding this thing. So, uh, okay, so I'll answer the second uh, question of uh, Alex. Uh, the cache layer is uh, on Nginx, and uh, I mean, the data is in the Ceph cluster and the Nginx is only saving the, uh, the requests for a limited time. And eventually Nginx will send just the authentication API, uh, the authentication requests and not the all requests. I mean, if the object is uh, one gigabyte, you will send just uh, uh, the authentication uh, request and the RGW will not try to fetch the data, only the metadata of the object to check for the ACLs. Uh, uh, the Nginx knows uh, where to send the request uh, in the configuration with just uh, configuring the backend uh, uh, servers. And the question of uh, DevRim. Uh, currently, uh, Nginx has QoS, but no, we, we don't have a real bandwidth by a RGW user uh, on top of Nginx. Is, it, is this uh, your question, Devrim? Uh, one thing to add with, with your permission is that um, basically we should decide uh, what is the proper configuration? Uh, I mean, according to our organization and our uh, S3 service, as Or mentioned before, um, the cache uh, TTL is configurable in the NGNX conf. So basically, we should uh, we should uh, keep in our minds that uh, there are objects that are being frequently updated. Uh, so we need to uh, flush the cache uh, more often and uh, not, for example, have this configuration saved for one day because if the objects are being uh, changed four times a day, uh, so we won't get the latest version of, uh, of our object because objects are reputable. So this is uh, from that perspective. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. So last question here by David Duncan, and then we can move towards the end and and if there are any further questions we can move to discord so david mentions that so this is interesting do you see an ease of opportunity to use other types of services or caching layers now for cdn for flexibility i mean he means not just for nginx so uh, currently there is another approach uh, using uh, cache layer inside RGW, so it's another thing. Um, yes, um, we are not uh, currently uh, investigating in uh, other solutions for uh, external CDN. And the thing is that uh, if the, for example, uh, Varnish or uh, any other solution uh, uh, of HTTP caching uh, can uh, implement the sending of the authentication API and and uh, maybe using Lua or something else uh, to wrap the request after it, it will be uh, suitable to, I mean, it's not uh, limited to Nginx. The solution is not limited to Nginx, just the the first implementation is uh, of Nginx. The, the special thing here is the implementation of the authentication API and cache API. So we can 
cache objects and we we are still uh, using uh, authentication there. Uh, so this is the special thing. To just cache HTTP response is quite easy, but to cache HTTP response of S3 and, uh, and authenticate it, it's uh, something we didn't see somewhere else. And um, this is it. Um, did, uh, do you, uh, did you did you did we answer your question? Okay. Yep. So, David David says thanks all. Thanks, Sean, and uh, thanks a lot, Sean, and all for this amazing talk. Uh, so, if if anyone wants to have any further discussions, you you can join session room four on Discord for reaching out to our speakers here. Thanks again, guys. And thank you, guys. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you very much. Feel free to contact us if you have any any additional Thank questions. you very much.